AI is reshaping everything, from how we work and learn to how nations compete for influence on the global stage. What does AI mean for ordinary people, and how should we respond to its risks and opportunities? In this episode of People's Daily Talk, I visit Shostman College at Tsinghua University to speak with Professor Xuelan, the college's dean and the director of the Institute for AI International Governance. Welcome to the talk, Professor. My pleasure. So let's start with some questions or issues that ordinary people care about the most. First, will AI take over human jobs? This is my personal concern as well. You know, nowadays there are so many AI anchors. So in your opinion, what kind of uh, jobs are most likely to be replaced by AI? Probably those white collar jobs working with uh, knowledge and working with information and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you're writing assistant, uh, you know, for a, a, a politician, uh, you're a uh, legal assistant for a major law firm and so on. Those type of jobs indeed are vulnerable. Okay, so yeah. how about journalism then? Journalism as well, <laughs> certainly. I think that uh, 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 certainly it's possible. Uh, but at the same time, I, that really, I think, if we're talking about the, the, the best quality journalism, really getting to the, the site of the event, mm -hmm. and really has uh, this keen observation on the issues, and then writing sort of a kind of a penetrating analysis, and that can never be replaced, certainly not in the short term, be wow. replaced. Yeah. So that might be the focus or advantages of you know human reporters. Exactly. So, so I think that uh, you know, for even for the kind of jobs I, I was describing, the top-notch people are still hard to be replaced. Uh, so it's really more of the middle range, the middle to you know good quality work that that can be replaced. Uh, your suggestion might be uh, to be the top. You, of yeah, that job. Yeah, yeah, you really have to be on at the top of your line and, and also you have to have some sort of unique kind of jobs. You, if you have, you can develop this you know, specific uh, quality to feel about the compassion and to demonstrate your uh, curiosity. And if you can combine of those that's so uh, special mm -hmm. uh, for human beings, those quality I think would be hard to be re replaced. Why do some AI systems appear ineffective in everyday applications? Some may not understand your orders, and some it's so easily to tell it is AI-generated content. Could you tell us uh, what are those core technical challenges they face? We have to understand how the current system can be so powerful. Then we can also understand what, what its limitations. Mm -hmm. In terms of the you know, generating the content, you know, ask a question and, and then it responded to us. It's really by correlation. It's been trained by so many, seen so many, you know, uh, various tech readings and so on. So they see the correlation, most likely, which words are going to be together. But they actually don't understand the, the real causalities between those answers. Indeed, for many cases that uh, the system doesn't really understand mm. the real causality behind it. So that makes it hard for it really to shift from one, one context to another. So they can be very good at one particular thing. But you say, okay, given what you've learned about this, how, how about shifting this to another you know, set of things like human beings? We can adapt and uh, to try to use what we learn from one context to move to another. But that's not how the system works. So that's sort of one limitation. The other thing, of course, I think it's, um, I mean, it's still a black box, how the system actually works. So you do have a situation that in the so-called hallucination, and I really you know, gave the, the, the totally wrong, you know, wrong uh, response. I think there is certainly, I think we have to be very careful, some really uh, important uh, context. For example, if you want to, the system to, uh, you know, to, to be a doctor, mm -hmm. and then you have to be very careful. And so that's another set of issues. The third is that, um, remember, I think the system, no matter how powerful, uh, it is really based on what you trained you know, the system for. Right. So there are indeed, I think, many of the things that they may be the system have not been trained for. 
or maybe the data itself are having a lot of problems, biases and so on. So that also may end up, you may end up, you know, you train on the data with a lot of biases, so you respond. The response you get will also have biases. Right. So that's also problematic. So I think those are the kind of limitations that we have to be realistic. So how do you see the prospect? Is it going to be perfect, like even take over humans like in the sci-fi movies someday? Um, you know, very hard to say. <laughs> uh, but certainly people do expect that in the next few years, it's very likely we might achieve so-called AGI, the artificial general intelligence. And, and that will be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And the real concern is whether we'll get a chance, get to the time when the system will be out of control. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we are, will be in huge trouble. So that's how we should really try our best to prevent that from happening. Right. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's the way that we should go to make it so perfect, maybe out of Well, I, I think that certainly we're in this kind of dilemma. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we certainly want to improve the system, right? right. To you know, reduce the hallucination, to make it you know, possible to do a better reasoning and so that they know the causality and so on. But the more you do that, it's likely that the system might also be able to have its own mind. You know, purpose. <laughs> own mind, exactly. <laughs> uh, own mind, so in the, the system might actually uh, you know, think about why can't I in in the control position, why, why, do, why do I have to be controlled by human beings, right? Mm. So concern on, on those situations, uh, there are already some studies being done that to show that uh, there is indeed sometimes you see the system that's actually deceiving human beings. Uh, so that's, you know, worrisome. Mm. Yeah. So um, as a professor and dean yourself, how do you envision mm. AI transforming education? Because I know, like mm -hmm. many of your students might already use AI to complete their assignments. Yeah. So yeah. how do uh, professors or institutions cope with that? Yeah. I think, of course, I think, you know, if I can think of AI's application in education, there, there, there are potentially two broad categories. One is that without changing the current system, the AI tools are used to facilitate, to improve the efficiency of learning. So I think that's the one type of use. Mm -hmm. Another type of use that it's really re-examining of our system in, you know, in, in general to see whether given the we're in the AI age, if we are redesigning the system today, are we gonna have the current system? Are we gonna divide people into different disciplines? Are we gonna divide them into you know, sort of grade one to grade five or grade six and then going to the <laughs> A secondary school and pri in a high school and then to college. Mm -hmm. So you might do it totally differently. So I think the second type of change uh, is going to be quite disruptive and it's going to take a lot of time to make the change. So I think mostly people are using that in the first category without changing the system but how do we make the current learning more effective. Mm -hmm. And here in terms of student using the AI tools for their assignments. I think it's unlikely that we are going to be effective in stopping students from doing that. Uh, anyway, the tool is there and it, it can, can, can do a better job, right? Yeah. So I think here it's more about how can professors, teachers, they use the, uh, you know, the assignments in, in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. For example, what we do, the assignments and so on, you are really trying to examine whether the student have learned what they, 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 they should learn. And so you want to get the feedback. Well, then you might as well produce different kind of exams, mm -hmm. right? Different kind of home, homework assignment. So I heard there were professors who were saying, well, you know, why not uh, encouraging students using sort of the AI tools? Mm -hmm. So use two AI tools to, to do the assignment and then, then analyze the difference in, uh, after two. Mm -hmm. That's one way, right? There can be many other creative ways, you know, recognizing that those tools will be used anyway to see how that can be. Yeah, it is a very honest answer, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you can be creative in designing the assignment at first. Yeah, okay. so, so, so I think that's really 
So the professors really have to change their way yeah, of using time, yeah, I mean, during the AI time. Yeah. When discussing AI development, we mm -hmm. must consider a very important players, that mm -hmm. is enterprises. Yeah. So take DeepSeek mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Despite facing uh, US chip restrictions, it's still shaking up the global AI industry and also challenging the biggest players. Yeah. So how do you see those domestic AI advances, mm -hmm. especially in light of the uh, technological constraints? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, I think deep sea is really, I think it's generated a huge uh, impact in the, in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, it, it does have a lot of innovations in terms of how they train the data, how they really gain the, the knowledge and uh, use that to improve their models. The other thing is also their business um, models of the sort of open source in a very complete way, not just in, in the language models, but also in their, you know, reasoning models. So they are they're both technically capable, but also they're also quite, in the business sense, also they are quite capable. Uh, that really, I think, um, shows to the, I think a lot of the, not just the Chinese innovators, but it's also global, you know, uh, global-wise, that uh, despite there's a sort of industry consensus of the so-called scaling law, mm -hmm. it's a more powerful, you know, compute, the large, mo the, the, the more data, and then you get uh, better performance. Despite the, the consensus on, on that, you still have, if you are uh, innovative enough, uh, if you have strong self you know, confidence, you can still find it inno innovative ways mm -hmm. to do things in a different, uh, differently. So that I think it's really, um, I think provided strong incentive for innovators, you know, large or small. Chinese or, or, or international to try their, their best to, to push the envelope. Yeah. And that's where I think what really innovation is about. Yeah, so they at least prove there is still opportunities yeah, in that. Yeah, there's still, there's still ways, yeah. Yeah, so um, the AI industry is rapidly mm. developing mm. as a whole, but many developing countries mm -hmm. has yet access or benefit from those uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to us what is AI divide? This mm -hmm. is still a pressing global issue. Yeah. You know, given the AI's development in over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, it's increasingly concentrated in some major companies. So in some major countries. So yeah. I think clearly now in the US and China the, in, the, in the first league, and some other countries in, in behind, and, and uh, of course, many developing countries are left behind. Uh, and so I think that um, uh, in, in, in terms of the capabilities of you know, having those big models, you do have countries that simply don't have any viable major AI companies. So that's sort of, you know, uh, a, a reality. I think what people are concerned about is that um, if this is going to be the trend, uh, it's the future of the world. I mean, if indeed, as we've been talking about, AI has been, you know, so it's going to be so powerful right. in having in the impact on jobs and so on, uh, will the future of the world be dominated by a few countries or a few companies in those countries? So that's what people are concerned about. And of course, uh, uh, in terms of the developing country situation, uh, you know, this, you know, uh, AI divide, you can trace that to the digital divide. Mm. Because AI is totally reliant on many of the infrastructure, so-called digital infrastructure. And there, I think many of the developing countries are still lagging behind. Even, I think in, in some developing countries, even the regular, uh, you know, infrastructure for industrial revolution, they're still also lagging behind. Uh, the basic infrastructure for the, like, you know, electricity grid and so on, that's sort of the, the baseline, mm. right? That's the uh, in, industrial revolution type of uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, uh, digital infrastructure, internet connection and so on. So all of those are indeed part of this, uh, uh, you know, so-called uh, AI, AI divide. divide. Yeah. So what role can China play to, you know, bridge in this gap? Yeah. China has been strong support to find ways to bridge this gap. 
So in last uh, July, uh, you know, China, you know, working with other um, many other countries, submitted a, a resolution at the UN to uh, strengthen capacity building uh, at the global level, particularly for developing countries, and that was supported unanimously by uh, many countries. And so that was adopted, and now China and the work, China is working with Zambia. Uh, started a, a group of uh, friends on AI capacity building to work you know, on implementing that resolution. Mm. Yeah. From your previous interviews and public speeches, you always uh, emphasize on the balancing of AI development and also governance. Yeah. Why it is so critical to you? Yeah, I think on the one hand, of course. You know, if we want to, you know, to move forward with AI's, uh, you know, uh, development, certainly we wanted to have innovation. We want to push the envelope, and so that we can overcome of these uh, limitations of the AI system. But at the same time, when we move forward uh, towards the frontier, we also recognize there's a potential for the system out of control. We also move, have the potential that some people will use that for deep fake. Those sort of risks also is getting is going to be increased, so you always have to be vigilant for those potential risks. So you have to really move along two wheels. Mm -hmm. One is pushing for the innovation, and the other is pushing on the governance, so that you can really, uh, you know, generate uh, AI for good, AI for human beings, and so that we can really, uh, uh, you know, take full advantage of this the technology. So how can countries? achieve that? I would say it's, a, it's an adaptive process. Uh, it's a learning by doing. So many people say, can we, maybe we should first develop as, you know, a defense and develop the God real uh, before we move on the innovation side. That's a very wishful thinking <laughs> because without really pushing for the innovation, you don't know where to build the God real. Right. right? So basically you have to push on the one hand on the innovation side, and then you see some problems, and then you try to address that, and then you know, back and forth. Mm. That's the system that China has been doing, the adaptive approach, and uh, learning by doing, that's what uh, we do. And, uh, and I would assume that, that that's probably other countries can, can, can learn from you know, the China's experience. Yeah. yeah, all right, that's all of my questions. Thank you for your sharing. Okay. So I hope by watching this episode, our audiences can have a better understanding of the AI landscape and also be more prepared to adapt to it. Thanks for watching.